So I'm here to answer your questions, okay? We have Sean in the back there. Can you raise your hand? Sean is going to be live streaming our session over the internet around the world. So other people will have the benefit of listening in as well, people that aren't local. And we have Zach and Sonny over there. Zach and Sonny, you guys want to? Zach is there and Sonny. How many of you have downloaded the Duke Spine Institute app on your phone? How many of you have downloaded the app? Bravo. That's fantastic. How many of you didn't know about the app? All right, you're forgiven this time. <laughs> but you can't leave it until you download it. Just kidding. The app is really a great resource for you because it has lots of information about common back and neck issues. Plus, it gives you an opportunity to get in touch with Duke Spine Institute. You can schedule a seminar, I mean, a face-to-face -face seminar just between you and I, basically. Uh, we do a lot of video conferencing with people around the world. I do it for free at this time. We don't charge for it. So you could basically have your MRI or CAT scan personally reviewed by myself and my team, like Luis over there. Luis, you want to raise your hand? And then we've got Lauren. Lauren is a, is a big shot, I'll just say that, okay? She's basically uh, heads up our, I don't even know, patient outreach and- I'm head of business development. Business development, sure. Valerie, right? Did I get your name right? Tiffany. Oh, <laughs> All right, Tiffany, you want to stand up? All right. Good evening, everyone. Hi. So this is some of our team here at Duke Spine Institute, and uh, they've all stuck around to, to help out with the seminar. Um, but really, we want to make it an interactive session, and if you haven't downloaded the app, and you're interested in, in downloading the app, talk to Zach over there, or Sonny, and uh, I was going to say Sonny's the one with the glasses, but they both have glasses. <laughs> all right. How many of you have met me before? All right, so about half of you, okay? So, what makes Duke Spine Institute so special? Anybody know? Laser. Laser surgery, okay, good. That's a good reason. Why else? Okay, well hopefully tonight I'll be able to teach you why. I'll tell you why I think Duke Spine Institute is special. For no other reason other than our results. Our results. Okay? People suffering with chronic back and neck pain want one thing. They want to get rid of their pain. They want to get rid of it, and they don't want to have a complication while they're getting rid of it. They don't want to end up worse than they went in. And believe it or not, that can happen. So when you're selecting a facility to cure your back and neck pain, you want to go somewhere where they can get it done quick, get it done right, and you don't leave worse off than you went in. You want to get go out of there basically with your problem fixed. <coughs> so every one of our patients, that's our goal. For every single patient that walks through these doors, we want to fix their problem, and we don't want to create a complication. And because we do that better than anyone else, that's what I believe makes us very special okay, around the world. That's why we have patients who travel from all over the world to this location right here to have treatment. Okay? Some of you are my patients. Some of you have received treatment here. So you know all the little perks that we have, right? Like answering the phone when you call. How many doctors' office answer the phone now? Not so many. It's really hard to get a hold of anyone when you need them. If you need a prescription refill or you, need a, you have a problem, you have a question, it's almost impossible. Right? I'm a patient too. I have trouble getting in touch with doctors. I hate it. It's not the way I was brought up. My father was a doctor, and when patients needed something, they called the office, somebody answered the phone. Somebody answered the phone. Would you believe it? My father was a surgeon. He was an OB-GYN. OB-GYNs are considered surgeons. And I grew up in his office. I was four years old, walking through the office. I went there because they had lollipops. Yeah. And for a four-year-old, five-year-old, the lollipop was everything. It's all you can think about all day. You know, lollipop. By the way, if you want to get more food, feel free to come up here. You're not being rude. So, my dad had two employees. One person worked the front desk. They collected the money and gave the patient a receipt. The other person was a nurse who helped them see the patients and do procedures, right? When he wrote a note, 
after seeing a patient. You know how many sentences his note was? One. Two sentences. Two. That's it. And he could see 45 patients a day. And he was a fantastic doctor. He lived in the hospital because his patients were always going to labor. They were always having emergencies, you know, related to the pregnancy and delivery. So he spent his time taking care of patients. He didn't spend his time writing notes that are 35, 40 pages long to make insurance companies happy so they'll pay you a minimum of $80. That's what we do now. We have 20 employees per doctor. Think about that. You're old enough. You were a young man when you went to see the doctor when my dad was practicing back in the early 80s, right? And you would walk in the doctor's office and you'd be seen quickly and the visit was quick and the note was quick and all the insurance stuff worked beautifully. Now we have 25 people per doctor just to take care of all the paperwork for the insurance companies. They have saddled us with this humongous burden. So why am I talking about this? I'm talking about it because it affects your care, all of you. Whenever you go to the doctor's office, doctors can't take care of the patient because they're so busy taking care of the paperwork and the documentation, the insurance company created, so they can get out of paying us. Okay, so that's one of the reasons Medicare is, is so bad these days. Well, not medical, medical care is so bad these days, not just Medicare. Okay, so what we do here is we try to stick to the values that I grew up with in medicine, which is to take the best care of the patient humanly possible, to give them the absolute best experience. And as a CEO and founder of Duke's Plan Institute, that's what I've done here, okay? Now, we're not perfect, we make mistakes too, you know, we're human. But we try, we strive for perfection, so we try to do our best for our patients. That's something that we don't talk about, right? We talk about results, but we don't talk about what it takes to get there, and all the effort, and all the people behind it. So I'm talking about it now, so you all can hear, okay? So what sets us apart is, is really not my good looks. <laughs> it's our results. It's fixing pain and not harming the patient while doing it. You've all heard horror stories about people having back surgery, neck surgery in other places, <laughs> and being hospitalized and staying in the hospital for a long time, having complications, whether it's an infection or pneumonia or blood clots, all kinds of stuff happen, right? We're doing all those complicated surgeries now outpatient. So fusions of the spine, we do here. We've been doing them here now for six years, since we opened our building. This year, we're aging. We're aging, okay? Well, there's lots of people who age that don't have any back in their so that's not the reason. But thank you. I like the fact that you're answering the question. Injury? Injury. All right, fair enough. Injury, that's correct. It's due to an injury. Virtually 100% of the time, back and neck pain is due to an injury. Okay? It's due to an injury. Now, sometimes you're going to have an infection, which in a way is injury, because it causes inflammation and causes injury. Other times you'll have a tumor that will cause pain. But again, it causes pain by injuring the bone and the periosteum and the ligaments and tendons that actually have pain fibers. So in the end, injury and inflammation, inflammation from injury is why people have back and neck pain. Inflammation from injury. Which is why anti-inflammatories work pretty well, to a degree, for treating back and neck pain, right? But chronic pain, what makes pain chronic? Anybody know how we define chronic pain? Okay, good, good, I hear some answers. The definition is really pain that lasts longer than six weeks. Okay, so you have acute pain, which is not cute. You don't look cute when you're in pain. But you have acute, A-C-U-T-E, pain, which is pain that literally lasts less than two weeks. Okay, subacute is two weeks to six weeks, and chronic is greater than six weeks. So chronic pain is really what we're going to talk the most about here tonight. And if you have questions about acute pain, no problem. But most people with acute pain, a lot of times the pain will resolve on its own. You pull a muscle or something, it gets better on its own. So we're going to talk mostly about chronic pain. So the most common cause of chronic pain in the neck and back are, are the facet joints. 
How many know what the facet joints are? Yes, sir, do you know? What are they? I know where they are. Okay. <laughs> I've right. had issues with them. <laughs> so the facet joints are basically joints that run up and down the entire spine, from your tailbone all the way at the bottom, all the way up to the bottom of your skull. All right? Your spine is full of joints. And we're going to see that in just a minute. Now, another cause of chronic pain are the discs, the spinal disc. Many of you have heard of a disc. A disc is basically a big shock absorber, jelly pad washer between two of the bones of the spine. Okay. And you've got seven of those bones in your neck. You've got 12 of them in your thoracic, and you've got five of them at the lumbar. So between each and every one of those bones, like a little hamburger patty between two bones, is a disc. Okay, the disc is the hamburger patty part. She didn't like the food? She's going to get glass. I'm joking. All right, what else causes pain? The sacroiliac joints. That's another cause of pain. They're down here, just on the side of the butt cheeks. And then muscle injuries. And the most common muscle injury we see is the piriformis muscle. It's a tear in the muscle deep inside the butt cheek. And it causes horrible, sharp pain right at the butt cheek. And it's fixable. All these things are fixable, by the way. But the most important thing you need to understand is that you can't fix neck or back pain if you don't know where it comes from. Now, I assume you're all here for neck and back pain, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody is here for, like, <laughs> something else. <laughs> uh, sinus <laughs> surgery? <laughs> the buffet. <laughs> <laughs> bravo, bravo. You marketed the buffet very well. So, um, the most important step, first step, in fixing a patient who has chronic neck or back pain is to make the right diagnosis. When you go to the eye doctor and you say my, my vision is blurry, what's the first thing they got to do? Yeah, they got to figure out why your vision is blurry. Is your glasses prescription off? Do you have an infection in your eye, pink eye? Do you have inflammation? Do you have an allergic reaction that's changing your vision? Right? Do you have a patch over your eye because you just finished celebrating the Pirates Week in Tampa? Right? So why is your vision blurry? That's what the doctor has to do. They gotta figure out why. That's step number one. Then you correct the problem, right? So if you're nearsighted, you get glasses for nearsighted. If you're farsighted, you get glasses for farsighted. The point is, you can't fix the problem until you know it and understand it. So I use that vision as an example because we all understand that, right? I see a lot of people wearing glasses here. I wear glasses too, just not right now. <laughs> So the point is, is that doctors can't fix things unless they know what's wrong. Now there's a lot of doctors out there who won't tell you they don't know what's wrong. Or worse yet, they think they know what's wrong when they really don't. And this is particularly true when it comes to back and neck pain. There are thousands and thousands <coughs> of doctors that think they know how to fix back and neck pain, but they don't. And if they do, it's a great risk and peril to you. You understand? what I'm saying? So what separates us from those other doctors? That is, we're separated because we have knowledge about the causes, we have experience, and that knowledge and experience allows us to use technology. Technology, we're going to talk about some of the technologies that we use here to, to figure out why patients have problems. Okay. So we invest a lot of time, if you come here as a patient, we invest a lot of time figuring out what's wrong. That's the first thing we do. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you an example. I do have a mother, believe it or not, yes I do. I was not conceived from immaculate conception. <laughs> so my mother was visiting a few years ago, and she developed a problem with her eye, red, and sinus came on suddenly. She went to the doctor, and I won't tell you who she went to, but it wasn't here, because we didn't do primary care at the time. And she said, I've got this red eye, and my sinuses are clean. The doctor, like many doctors, said, well, it could be virus, so I'll give you an uh, antiviral, and it could be bacteria, so I'll give you an antibiotic, 
and it could be allergic, so I'll give you an allergy medicine. Right? Shotgun approach. We've all seen it and heard it before. That's not the right way to treat that. So the kind of things that you'll hear with doctors who don't know what's wrong with you or don't know what's wrong with their patient, they'll try an epidural. Okay? Epidural is the go-to, or worse yet, they'll try pain pills. We'll give you some Percocet. We'll give you some Norco. That's how we got everybody addicted on these things. It's because the primary care docs, I, I hate to say it, but that's where it is, they just started writing for people with <coughs> narcotic, right? And it's, it's their fault and it's not their fault. Because they had companies that were persuading them to do this. Right? You have patients with chronic back pain, you need to give them narcotic pain. So they would come in, they write Percocet, Percocet. If you're a primary care doc, what's the easiest patient you're going to see all day? The patient with hypertension, diabetes, you know, kidney disease, or the patient who has chronic back pain needs a refill. Right? Easy money. Easy. You're just going to write that prescription. You get paid the same amount of money. Whether you're taking care of a patient with diabetes, hypertension, kidney failure, stroke, or you're taking care of a patient that has chronic back pain. One takes one minute, the other takes 20 minutes. You get paid eighty dollars. Which one do you think the primary care doctors want to fill their schedule with? So we've got a whole country full of people with chronic pain that have been mistreated by doctors, not just primary care doctors, but spine surgeons too, physiatrists, all kinds of doctors. The blame goes all the way around. Okay? And why? I don't think these doctors meant to do it intentionally. I just don't think they know how to figure out what's wrong with the patient and how to fix it. And that's what we do different than everyone else right here. That's why people come here. Okay? They come here because of our ability to do that. So let's talk a little bit about the anatomy. The anatomy of the spine. The spine, as I told you, is made up of bones. Okay? And there'll be a test on this in 15 minutes. <laughs> Alright? The vertebral body. For those of you who don't pass the test, you've got to stick around. All right, you got to come here and stick around and help us out for a couple of days. I think Lauren will put you to work, right? So the vertebral body is just a bone, and these bones stack on top of each other and make up a column. How many of you have columns in your garden? You put plants on top of them, right? What does a column do? Support weight, right? The roof. Plant, statue, whatever it's supporting, it's supporting weight. What do you think the spinal column does? It supports the weight of your body. Your head, your arms, your chest, everything, all your organs inside, they're all attached to your spinal column. Okay? So all that weight, your whole life, when you're up walking around, running, twisting, bending, active, all that weight goes right to your spine. So where does that weight go? Well, 80% of it goes through your disc. 20% goes through your facet joint. It depends on your posture. So it could be 85-15, it could be 80-20. But basically, 80% goes through your disc. Every single one of your discs has weight <coughs> going through them. Which disc has the most weight? Well, it's the one right here at the very bottom. It's called the L5-S1 disc. It's the bottom disc in your spine. It's right where your belt runs. is. If you're a man or woman and you wear a belt here, Guys wear their belts a little lower, ladies wear a little higher, I think. But wherever your belt runs, that's pretty much where the L5-S1 disc is. And the disc above it is L4-5. And those two, L4-5 and L5-S1 in the lower back, are the most common discs to be injured and the most common discs to cause pain from the injury. Okay. In the neck, the most common disc is C5-6, and then C6-7, and then C4-5. So it all has to do with the shape of the spine, it has to do with the size of the facet joints, the size of the disc. But you have no control over those things, okay? Now there's another type of joint besides the disc. One of those joints is called the facet joint, and the other is called the disc. And finally, in the lower back, there's a sacroiliac joint, which is probably responsible for about 5% of chronic back pain. 5%. That'll be on the test. Okay. Now, normally, your facet joints, the most common cause of back pain that's chronic, the facet joints, 
it's arthritis in the facet joints that causes the pain. Okay? So people with facet joint disease or arthritis complain of stiffness and pain, especially when they're twisting and bending and doing stuff. Okay? So stiffness and pain with movement, painful movement. Any questions so far? All right. So the number one cause of chronic back or, or neck pain is arthritis in these facet joints. You see that right there? Now what the arthritis does is, what is arthritis? Anybody know? Inflammation. Inflammation. Good. Whoever said that? Problem. Itis is inflammation, right? Sinusitis. Sign you, situs. Sign is sinuses, itis is inflammation. Inflammation in the sinus. Uveitis, inflammation in your eye. Meningitis, inflammation of the brain coverings. So all the itises are inflammation. They have different causes, right? So meningitis may be viral from a viral infection or a bacterial infection. But facet joint arthritis, right here, this is not from an infection. This is just good old osteoarthritis. So the cartilage in the joint has been destroyed through injury, and now it's bone, grinding on bone, and it's causing inflammation. Okay? So you get these little bone spurs, and the joints get bigger over time. They actually enlarge. Did you know your body responds to stress by enlarging things? Huh? Did you all know that? If you drink a lot of alcohol every day, what do you think happens to your liver? It gets bigger. If you lose a kidney and you only have one, what do you think happens to the other kidney? It's got to do the job of two. It gets bigger. It grows. If you lift weights every day, what do you think happens to those muscles? You've seen it, right? You all know Arnold Schwarzenegger? Huh? So he was a perfect example of what happens to your muscles when you stress them every day. You stress an organ, it gets bigger. And it responds by hypertrophy and it gets larger. Your joints and bones are no different. Okay. So that's why you get the arthritis with enlargement of the joint, and that inflammation it destroys the ligaments of the joint and the tendons. And when you start destroying the ligaments and tendons in the joint capsule, you get instability. The joint starts moving more. It becomes what's called lax, and it causes more damage. So it's a vicious cycle. Damage, inflammation, more damage, inflammation, more damage. So that's why there's so many people with back and neck pain, is because they have all this inflammation in these small little joints. Pain meds don't work. Because pain meds, if you think about it, you're trying to target this tiny little place in your body, one little spot, right? The joint's about as big as your pinky right here, this little pinky tip. That's how big the joint is. So your whole body is pretty big. You, you, drink, you eat that medicine, that ibuprofen or Motrin, it's going to go to your whole body. It doesn't just go where you want. So that's why the field of interventional pain management is so amazing. Interventional pain management is what we do here at Duke Spine Institute. It's one of the things we do because it's one of the treatment modalities that actually works to cure back and neck pain. Okay? And what it involves is targeting specific joints in your body with a needle and using an x-ray machine or ultrasound to get there, to navigate there, right? <laughs> so interventionalists are doctors who specialize really in treating very specific, painful, usually painful structures using fluoroscopy, which is x-rays, ultrasound, and getting in there with a needle and either injecting something to reduce the inflammation or burning something, basically, to kill a pain nerve there, okay? We're going to talk about those. But right here, you can see in the bottom right picture is a needle being used to inject a nerve that goes to the facet joint. Right? That nerve is called the medial branch of the posterior primary ramus. That, that's going to be on the test too, okay? I'm just telling you right now. All right. So we call this the medial branch block and rhizotomy. Now, why does it have such a long, complicated name? Because it actually means two different procedures. There's a block, 
and there's a rosetta. How many of you had a block in your life? Raise your hand. Yeah, sure. All of you have. All of you have had a block. Who knows what I'm talking about? Who's had a cavity drilled? Yeah. I've had my cavities drilled. Does a dentist just walk up to you and put a drill on your tooth and start going at it? Or do they do something first? Huh? They used to? You don't have insurance, that's what they do. What they do first is they put their finger in your mouth and they take a needle and they inject numbing medicine. What are they doing? They're blocking a nerve that goes to your jaw and all your teeth, right? By blocking that nerve, you can drill on your tooth and you won't even feel it. Otherwise, you would never let anybody draw in two. It's too painful. You guys okay? Yeah, please. So, the point is, is that blocks are used throughout medicine by different doctors for different reasons. We use them in treating back and neck pain because two things. Number one, sometimes they can be used as a treatment or therapy. We call it a therapeutic form. Therapeutic form. Okay? And sometimes we use them as a diagnostic block. Diagnostic blocks and therapeutic blocks are different. Okay? So the dentist blocked your nerve for therapy. He did a therapeutic block so he could drill your teeth and you won't feel it. Sometimes we do diagnostic blocks. We will numb a joint or a nerve just so that we can find out if that's the source of the pain. Right? After all, if you've got a spine and you've got a facet joint here, 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 and the patient's saying, I have pain here, well, <coughs> which one is it? Is it this one and this one, or is it this one, this one, this one? Or is it this one and this one? You can't tell. So we use a needle and, and a medicine, and we go in there and numb those joints up, the ones we think it is. So if we numb these two up and it takes 90% of the patient's pain away, we know we found the source of their pain. It was these two joints right there. So we use diagnostic blocks to localize where the patient's pain is coming from so we can treat it. So you may come in here and get a diagnostic block, and you may leave and it wears off. Don't be surprised. That was the intention. We would love for it to last, but it's not going to last because it's a diagnostic block. We're using that <coughs> for the diagnosis. Okay? If we are correct and we found the joints that are causing your pain, these are facet joints we're talking about, remember? We haven't talked about discs yet. We're not talking about herniated discs yet. That's next. We're talking about arthritis in the facet joints. So if we find the facet joints that are causing your pain, then we bring you back another day and we stick this probe in, it's a needle, and we hook it up to a wire and basically we heat the tip of this to 80 degrees Celsius. And that cooks this little nerve right here. It's, that nerve that it cooks is not the nerve going down your leg. Don't worry. That would be bad. I've heard of other doctors doing that. But um, we're just killing one nerve that goes to the joint that carries pain. Just pain from the joint. So we can get rid of that nerve. We don't get rid of it, we just cut it. It's like cutting a bridge, right? Once you destroy a bridge, the enemy can't cross the bridge and bring supplies to reinforce the troops. So you're basically blocking the transmission of pain going up to the brain. You don't want those pain signals going up. So that's what a rhizotomy is. Now some people will say, but Dr. Jim Major, if you take the pain away from the joint, aren't you just making the joint worse? No, movement makes the joint worse. Taking the, the nerve pain away doesn't make the joint worse. So arthritis of these joints cannot be reversed. It cannot be cured in terms of making a normal joint. There's no technology for that. What we can do is take the pain away. And by removing the pain, we increase patients' movement, we increase their quality of life. Now this procedure you're watching here, this rhizotomy, is a minor procedure. The risk of having a complication from it is probably less than one in a thousand. It's so rare. It's very straightforward. As long as it's done by a doctor who knows what they're doing. So if I did it, you'd probably get a complication because I don't do these. I do surgery. And this is not considered surgery. My partner does this. My partner is Dr. Patel and his fellows do these procedures. But they're trained to do them. They know what they're doing. 
So I, on the other hand, do surgery. I don't know how to do these procedures, so I don't do them. Does that make sense? So even a, even a neurosurgeon like me, who's highly trained to operate the spine, <coughs> doesn't know how to do a minor procedure like this. Okay? So that's why I don't do it. Right? That's what a doctor should do. When a doctor can't do something the best for a patient, they should always refer their patient to a doctor that can provide the best care for them. So that's what I do. That's my personal philosophy. That's our philosophy here. So that's why I have Dr. Patel, because Dr. Patel is the best at interventional pain management. Okay. Any questions about rhizotomy? So people with facet pain have axial pain and it usually stays in the back of the neck. It doesn't go all the way down to your toe. That's a pinched nerve usually. So like I said, I'll skip a few because some of these slides are a little too much for what we're trying to achieve. Yes? Um, if the pain is your body's way of telling you that you shouldn't be doing the movement, if you take away the pain, then aren't you going to do more of that movement and cause more damage? That's a great question. So a lot of my patients say when they get out of bed, just getting out of bed hurts. Just stay in bed their whole life. I mean, you could argue that, but then staying in bed your whole life is bad too, right? I mean, you're going to get all kinds of problems. So, yes, pain exists to tell your brain, hey, there's something wrong with my body, but what's wrong is not fixable, and what's wrong is keeping people from having a normal life. Whether it's shopping, whether it's golfing, whether it's traveling. You know, and we, we say here at Duke's Spine, you shouldn't allow pain to control your life. We don't believe pain should control your life. So there is no other way other than to surgically remove the joint and then you do an effusion. So your treatment options are limited. In 2019, you can take pills. Pills doesn't, doesn't fix the facet problem. Or you can burn the nerve to the joint or you can cut the joint out surgically and fuse the bones together. So fusion would work, and then you wouldn't have pain then. But you also would have a fused spine, and you'd have a major fusion surgery that you'd have to get through and recover. So you've got to kind of weigh things out, and if you take all the options for treating facet joint arthritis, the rhizotomy is the safest, best treatment there is. But I like the way you're thinking. You know, it's not really natural, should we be doing it? Yeah, but there's no really good alternative, that's the problem, except living in pain. If people don't want to live in pain, I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to either. Does this uh, also apply to pain like side pain, where, where it's not really that your back is hurting, but your back is causing it? Yes, sir. So the sciatic pain doesn't come from facet disease. It comes from a pinched nerve. Facet disease doesn't cause pinched nerve unless it's really advanced, which is a totally different topic. So, but most facet pain is just in your back. It doesn't go down your leg. All right. Do we have another question? Yes. So if you're targeting that and you burn that nerve, it, why does the pain come back? Great question. So why does the pain come back with the rhizotomy? Does the so nerve regrow? Good. These are all correct answers. There's not one answer. There are several possibilities. So one is that the nerve grows back. All right. And the second is that it's a different nerve because it may be the joint above or below the one that we burn. And so we're just off by one level, which the patients have a hard time telling, you know, where it is. There's no roadmap on your body that says, hey, the other nerve's here. Um, the other thing it can be is it can be what we're going to talk about next, which is the disc, right? So this is your facet joint right here where it says spinal cord. This is your facet joint. Your disc, is, the disc herniations happen right next to that. So they're very close. Literally the width of your pinky, that's how close the disc herniation is to the facet joint. That make sense? So from a patient standpoint, they can't really tell the difference. They just feel a sharp pain and their back tightens up. So they don't know if it's facet or disc. We do the numbing procedure to figure that out. If it's facet, we do the rhizotomy. Once we do the rhizotomy, if they get pain that comes back there, it may be the disc that's there. 
We always save the disc for the last treatment because it requires surgery. There's no other way to fix a disc herniation. It's symptomatic. So as far as getting the needle onto the nerve, that nerve is right there. It is literally, who is, who's had angel hair pasta? <laughs> We've all had angel hair, right? Most of us? I know you've had angel hair pasta. All right. So the nerve is as skinny as an angel hair pasta. And it's this far in your body. Like this is your skin, here's the nerve. And you got to get that needle probe right on there. And you can't see the nerve. You only see the x-ray picture. You only see the bones. So you use the x-ray to look for this bone right here and for this bone right here. And you kind of go between them, like right there. And that's where you put the probe. And you hope the nerve's there. But everybody's a little bit different. Some people, the nerve's a little bit over. And when you heat the tip of that needle up to degrees, what's the burn radius on one of those probes? You guys know? Our fellows? All right. They're looking at me like you're looking at me. It's, it, I think it's about 3 millimeters. I think it's about 2.5 to 3 millimeters. So if you're off from that nerve by more than 3 millimeters, you're not going to not going to get a complete burn. So that's the problem, is that some of these patients who have a lobotomy, remember you're doing several facets too. You may not get a complete burn on every single nerve. But you'd be very lucky. You'd be like hitting a bullseye six times in a row. Great questions. All right, let's talk about the disc. The disc has two parts to it. Remember I told you it's a big cushion between the bones. So it's got a jelly center, which is kind of bluish green in this picture, and it's got a thick rind holding that jelly in, and that's the purple stuff. Now we call the purple stuff the annulus fibrosis. And in this picture you can see why. It's got lots of little fibers, okay? And they crisscross to hold the jelly in. This is a super tough, tough, tough membrane. But we all seem to manage to injure it in our lifetimes. How do we injure our disc? Bending over, picking something up, you can injure your disc. Car accidents, falls. Those are the most common ways to injure discs. Trauma, some type of an injury, sports injury, gymnastics, basketball, golf, you name it. I've seen people, athletes who have injuries to the disc that play almost every single sport. Okay? I will tell you this, in all the years I've been doing this, it seems to me that the strength and tenacity of the disc has a genetic component. What I'm saying to you is, just as you, your hair color is determined by genes, it's out of your control, your natural hair color, you know, the length of your fingers, your nose, the shape of your face, all of that's genetically determined by your DNA, right? You don't have much control over it. Well, so is the same thing with the disc. The disc strength is genetically determined. So in families that have a lot of disc problems, the kids usually get those disc problems passed on in the genes. Okay? So not only is it an injury, but there's also a predisposition to injuring the disc that is hereditary that you inherit. Okay? So as I told you before, looking top down on a disc, you have a jelly nucleus propulsus and you have an annulus fibrosis. And this annulus is really thick. But the thinnest part, the, the weakest part, you will. Oh, we got a nice Duke Spine napkin. You see that? <laughs> I gotta take some of those home too. The annulus part that keeps the nucleus in, this prevents herniations, the annulus, prevents herniation by being strong. And it's like a wall to a castle, right? Once you breach that wall, the enemy gets in very easily. So the weakest part of the wall happens to be in the back on the side. That's also on the test, by the way. You got that? <coughs> so the, the place where tears happen most frequently is posterior, which is back versus anterior, posterior lateral, right here. It just so happens that this weakest area of the annulus where the tears happen, where the herniations happen, the most common, is also right next to where the nerves are. The nerves come out right, right here. Right there. Yeah. Okay. 
I didn't design it. <laughs> So when you do get a tear, we call it a failure of the annulus. Failure of the annulus, okay? And what happens, folks, is if you look up here, let me have your attention up here. The green is the annulus, you can see the tear. Now what's pushing those torn edges apart is this pink stuff, right? The pink stuff wants to get out. If we go to the slide before, you can see right over here, when there's pressure on a disc, it's pushing on the center. That pink stuff wants to push out. So it pushes against the annulus. And it's going to take, help me here, Bueller, Bueller, the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance. So the path of least resistance when a disc is loaded is right through the tear. And that's how you get a herniation. So this, folks, is a herniated disc. That's, that's the anatomy of a herniated disc. Now what's all this other funny looking stuff? These are nerve fibers. Okay? Remember I told you there's inflammation as the source of all pain? Virtually all pain, inflammation. It's the inflammation right here in the outer half of this herniation. That's where back pain and neck pain come from, from a herniation. Remember, facet pain is different. We're not talking about facet pain. We're past that. Now we're talking about disc pain. <coughs> so what do we call pain that comes from a herniated disc? We call it discogenic pain. Genesis means to create or originate, right? Genesis, the beginning, the creation. Discogenic is the, the pain that comes from a disc. Okay. Discogenic. Facetogenic is pain that comes from a facet joint, right? So you have facet pain, which is facetogenic. It originates from the facet. And discogenic originates from the disc. So when we talk about discogenic pain, that's one of the things we say, discogenic pain. This patient has discogenic pain. What we're saying is they have pain from their disc, from the, from the tear in the disc, from the herniation. Okay. So somebody said they came here to learn about laser. We're, we're good because of laser, right? And this is where I'll tell you a little, a, little, a little bit about what I discovered. And it's truly what I discovered. Is that nobody else really knows this. So when you go talk to other surgeons, they're going to look at you funny, right? It's this tear right here that causes the pain. It's that tear. What I do with the laser is I come in and I see this tear with the scope, arthroscopically, with the scope, and I use the laser to remove these painful little nerve fibers that go in and I remove the herniation and I clean up the tear. <coughs> when you clean up a tear in the human body, it's called a debridement. debridement. Have you all heard that before? Yeah. If you have a rotator cuff injury and it's torn, the surgeon goes in and does a debridement, right? So if you have a wound that doesn't heal, we come in and we cut the edges open and we do the breathing, clean it back. So I created the terminology of annular debridement, and I published it for the first time ever in the literature. And that is how you get rid of the back pain or the neck pain if it's your neck from a herniated disc, is through an annular debridement. That's why the laser surgery is so successful at getting rid of pain. Does that get rid of the pain that radiates down the leg or down the arm also? Yes, absolutely. The pain that radiates down the leg and arm comes from the nerve right here. You right. see the nerve? Right. But that inflammation here is leaking on the nerve. Look how close it is. It's right touching against the nerve. So when I get rid of this inflammation, I get rid of the inflammation on the nerve as well. Which is why the average relief of neck pain and arm pain is 95% neck, 95% arm. The average relief of back and leg pain is 95 and 95. It's identical. Because I've gotten rid of the source of inflammation with the laser. So you just take out the, the impending fragment of the disc. Yes. And then debride it. Then I debride the annulus. <clears throat> so here is the fragment of disc, the pink stuff, right? Mm -hmm. If I just did a discectomy, I'd just take the pink stuff out. But that's not good enough. You actually have to clean up these edges here of the green stuff so that this can heal back. Yes. 
And do you cauterize so the annulus meets? Because there's a gap there. Do you yeah. still stitch it together? So, great question. So she said, Dr. Dugmage, you're very observant. If you come in here with a laser and clean this up and get rid of all this stuff here and here, there's a gap. You're right. There's a gap. There's no stitching it back together. Your body stitches it back together after surgery, which is why I give patients restrictions when they have laser surgery. They can't bend over and pick things up, and they can't lift over 25 pounds for six weeks. So does scar tissue fill in there? Yeah, scar tissue. So you all know what scar tissue is, right? Who knows what scar tissue is? It has a medical terminology, a medical name. What is it called? Collagen. Have you heard of collagen before? Scar tissue is collagen. What is this annulus made of? Anybody know what the annulus is made of? Collagen. Who said that? You get extra credit. <laughs> so, your annulus is made up of collagen and elastin. Scar tissue is made up of collagen and elastin. So basically, when I take this out, your body heals it on its own. I don't need to put anything in it. I don't need to sew anything up. Yes, sir. Is the herniation easy to diagnose? Is the hernia? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's easy to find. So is the herniation easy to find? Yeah. For who? <laughs> for you. For me, yes, very easy. But for some reason, nine out of ten radiologists miss them. This is, this is done with uh, how do you, how do you go into identify with what? So MRI. MRI. MRI is the best test in the world to identify a herniation. Okay? And if you can't have an MRI because you got a contraindication, pacemaker, defibrillator, shrapnel, whatever, then you get a CT scan. Yes, sir. The easiest way to miss it is you take a picture of the wrong desk. Well, it's a really easy way to miss it. Yeah, I mean, the radiologists are supposed to, technicians are supposed to get all the discs in their <coughs> personal experience. Well, listen, I'm going to tell you guys, I can tell you guys stories. There was nothing wrong. Nothing I can wrong. tell you a story. It happens all the time. That's why I made the point. That's the sad thing about it is that the radiologists that read MRIs, literally 9 out of 10 of them, 9 out of 10 of these MRI centers you go to will underdiagnose. There'll be a herniation, they'll, they'll say it's normal. Okay. Because it's small. And they think that something small can't cause a problem. But that's the problem around the whole world. A lot of doctors that treat people with back and neck pain think small herniations don't cause pain. They do. They can be extremely painful. And big ones may not cause any symptoms at all. So we're not treating a herniation, we're treating a patient. And if the patient has pain from that small herniation, you need to fix it. <clears throat> if they have no symptoms from a big herniation, you need to leave it alone. You understand? So we, we're all mixed up. When I say we, I mean collectively, the 6,000 spine surgeons in the United States. So what I'm getting at is the size doesn't matter. What matters is, is there a tear and is that the source of the pain? And if it is, if you fix it with a laser, the pain goes away completely. Yes? Does insurance cover this type of procedure? Insurance can cover it. It depends on the insurance. And it depends on the patient. That's a roundabout answer because it's a roundabout, you know, it's a roundabout answer. The answer is it will. It will cover it. But you may have to fight your insurance. You're going to have to appeal a non-coverage decision. You may have to take it a step further. Medicare? Medicare won't right up front cover it, but if you fight them, you can win. Yeah. Yes. At what point do you uh, replace the disc and fuse the spine? At what point do I replace the disc and fuse? So I would say 98% of fusions that are done right now could be replaced with a laser surgery. Yeah, you only need to do it when there's a really bad slippage of one bone on the other. It's called a grade two listhesis or higher. Or if there's a big bone spur in the neck that's blocking access to the disc, which I've seen happen twice in my entire career. So 98% of people's fusions we don't need. 
we don't need to be doing the fusions. So why is it then that so many fusions are happening and so little endoscopic laser surgery happening? For a lot of reasons. Number one, where do doctors learn their surgery technique? Anybody know? Where do they train? They train at a university hospital. Okay, a university hospital. From a, what's called a residency program or a fellowship. Okay. Neurosurgery training is seven years. So after medical school, we spent seven years. None of the residencies in the United States of America, except for one, are teaching endoscopic laser surgery. None. Why? I've scratched my brain many nights trying to figure out why. And I realized the answer. Simple. When you do a fusion, you put metal, screws and rods, cages. Those parts you put in a patient are worth about $10,000 on average. Like everything, money. Yeah, money. So the companies that make them and sell them don't want the laser surgery around. And they are very, very, very powerful. More powerful than me, by far. I can't do anything against them. They're billion, billion, billion dollar companies. And they know about the surgery, but they are kind of like <coughs> Ford, GM, you know, with the electric cars. 60 years ago, they had the plans, but they just buried them in a safe because they didn't want people getting electric cars. They didn't want them to know so they would compete with their combustion engines. That's the sad truth. It's basically technology that's being kept from the public because big business is making too much money and the government's getting all that tax money from taxing those big companies. A fusion surgery may average $100,000, right? I mean, sure, we've seen them for four or $500,000 bills, but the average is probably around $150,000, okay? The laser surgery for the same, fixing the same problem is going to be around $30,000. So imagine how much money we would save if we got rid of fusion and we did endoscopic surgery. Plus, in 13 years I've been doing laser surgery, you know how many complications I've had? 1,000 patients. How many complications? Zero. Not a single one. The only problem we've ever had is one in 100 patients will re-herniate. So they'll push out another piece. And it's always when they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. And I tell them, don't bend at your waist, and they They'll bend at their waist and pick something up and they'll feel something. So the only thing that's ever happened is a recurrent herniation. And that in a thousand patients, I've had ten of them. So that's one percent. Other than that, not a single complication. There is no spine surgery in the world that has no complication, except for the two places. That's the only one. So do you do this on thoracic discs? We do not do this on thoracic discs. Only cervical and lumbar. The reason is that the thoracic spine has uh, ribs, and the heads of the ribs where they meet the spine block access. You can't go through it. Yeah, whereas the neck and the lower back don't have the ribs. Yes? Can the laser treatment um, fix any of those other types of yeah. in injuries that you're showing there? Sure. So a lot of people think laser cannot fix bone spurs, but it certainly can. And just remember, you see this bone spur right here, everybody? You see the red marker? There's a nerve that comes out of that hole, right? All the holes line up. There's a nerve that comes out of these holes. That bone spur is sitting on the nerve right there. But there's another bone spur right here. You see that one? That one in the front doesn't need to be fixed because it's not doing it. So when I go in with a laser, I will fix the bone spurs that need to be fixed, but I leave the others. So the answer is, yeah, lasers cut through steel. They cut through three-quarter inch steel, inch steel, depending on what laser you're using. So they can cut through a bone spur, no problem. We do it all the time. Well, yes, sir? Uh, what about a, a cyst that may have developed at the site? Is it bigger cyst? I'd have to see what kind of cyst. If it's a synovial cyst, no. If it's, I don't know what kind of cyst it would be, a spinal cord cyst? We have a point. I'd be happy to see. But usually cysts, if a cyst is the cause of the problem, which is unlikely, no, that's a good problem. But cysts are rarely the cause of the problem. I have to look at it. Sounds like a synovial cyst. So we'll talk about it.
All right, good questions. So when you have an injury to the disc, it's called discogenic pain, we already know that. Pain originating from an injured disc. Pain, the symptoms include back pain or neck pain, and then radiculopathy, which is symptoms going down your leg or down your arm. Those symptoms can be weakness, numbness, tingling, or pain. So here in this picture on the left, you have a herniated disc. I apologize, it's all one color. We're used to seeing it as two different colors. But the herniation is now pressing on or irritating the nerve, and the nerve is inflamed. That's what the red color is for, okay? Inflammation. So what happens with an epidural? So does every herniated disc that causes symptoms have to be treated with surgery? The answer is no. But it, the other treatment is an epidural. Epidural is an injection of anti-inflammatory medicine right where the herniation is. Okay? Right here. Do epidurals work all the time? No. They work about 50% of the time. How long do they last? They can last anywhere from a day to 10 years. I'd say the average is probably three months. So it's not really fixing the problem most of the time. It's just buying you time. So let's say you're a teacher. You're teaching biology, and summer break is in two months, and you're in horrible pain. That would be a perfect person to do an epidural, because that buys them time from having surgery and missing class, right? So some people want to just put things off for a month or two until they got their situation right. And that's why an epidural is a good, good thing for that. So does it hurt the tissue? I know when they give you for the shoulder and stuff, they can only give you three in a year or whatever, and, and it actually weakens the tendons Yes. Wow. That's correct. Is that same, the same? Yeah, so the epidural usually is a steroid. You're injecting a steroid. A steroid is a very powerful bioactive molecule. Your body produces steroids. They're right above your kidneys in your adrenal gland. Okay? We produce our own natural steroids. So what we're doing, though, when we inject the steroids, we're targeting a specific joint or muscle. We're targeting an area of inflammation in the body. If you do too much, absolutely. Those steroids don't just work right where the herniation is. They diffuse into your bloodstream and eventually they get transmitted throughout your whole body. Okay. Steroids work by affecting the DNA, by synthesis of proteins and enzymes. So they have an effect on regulating pathways within the cells that we won't talk about. But they have lots of different effects. And one of them would be to weaken tendons, raise your sugar. I mean, they do a lot of things, raise your blood pressure. So you don't want to do too much steroids because it can also destroy your joints, like your hip joints. Can be so are there things that it can damage in there? No, there's nothing in here, right here, that it'll damage. It'll just reduce the inflammation. But it'll do damage elsewhere in your body, which is why you don't want to do a lot of steroid injections. Dr. Patel here is very careful about not doing too many steroid injections. So here we have a picture of an MRI. Many of you have seen an MRI. These gray squares are bones. This is a normal disc right here the white thing, and in the back you have your annulus, that's the dark thing, and then back here you have nerves, that's the gray one, they're going down, they look like spaghetti, okay? And then you can tell I'm hungry, I keep talking about <laughs> pasta. And then here you have spinal fluid, which is the white stuff, it's water basically. So right here you have a small herniation. Now this is super tiny. Most doctors would look at this and say, you know what, that's not your problem. We're not operating. But honestly, I've operated on these and people's pain goes away. So it really just depends on the individual if that's the cause of their pain or not. That's what the doctor has to figure out. Most doctors will just blow it off and say that's not the problem, but it is most of the time the problem. So they're missing the diagnosis. Then you got a little bigger herniation right here. So these two discs you can see are not normal. These are normal. Okay. We also use x-rays and CAT scans to look for alignment. Alignment things are like scoliosis, where the spine twists to the side, or spondylolisthesis. What's a military neck? Very straight neck. Oh, okay. yeah, straight, like you're standing at attention. All right, spondylolisthesis is where you have one bone slipping on another. Take a look here, OK? This is L5 on the x-ray. Here's the L5-S1 disc. The back of this bone and the spine should line up back here. But it's slipped forward all this distance. That's called the spondylolisthesis. Listhesis means to slip in Latin. Spondo is spine. 
fine slippage. What percent was that? Huh? What, oh. per what percent was that? Uh, okay. Putting me on the spot, are you? Okay. I'd say that's almost a grade three. That's probably a two. I'd say that's from here to here is probably about 30% slippage. So one would not be significant. Well, it's significant, but can I fix someone's pain from this disc without fusing it? Yes, I can. I can get in here with the laser and I can repair the tear and get rid of the back pain. I've done it many times. I've operated with laser surgery on about probably about 80 of these. And I've been successful 75 <coughs> out of 80 times getting rid of the pain. So where's the nerve getting impinged on when it slips like that? The nerve gets impinged right here. Mm -hmm. See, the nerve comes out of these holes. Yeah, yeah. And look how small the hole is now. And your surgery does, does what? My, my surgery won't open the hole. It just unpinches the nerve by removing a herniation up here. So it takes the herniation out, but it doesn't. So when it slip line. like that, there's a herniation in that. Yeah, there's a herniation. That's correct. Now I can I can also correct this alignment. I can pull this bone back, but that takes screws and rods. So that's a different type of surgery, but it's certainly doable. And does that do anything for a person? I wouldn't do it. I do the laser surgery first. If that doesn't work, I would consider a fusion. We do nerve tests. Quite often here is one of our diagnostic tools looking at whether a nerve is pinched or damaged. So if somebody comes in with arm symptoms, numbness, tingling, or weakness, or, or some kind of sensory change, we're going to go ahead and get a nerve test to look for nerve damage. Discogram is another test that we do where we actually stick needles into the disc that we think are causing pain. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is a normal discogram. The dark stuff is the dye. And you can see in the back here, there's no tear. Whereas, look here, there's this tear, and all the dye is leaking out right here. See that? This is the source of pain. Same thing here. There's a tear right here in the back of the disc. So a discogram is a very important diagnostic test that we use in a patient that we think, all right, maybe they're having pain from their disc. The discogram will tell us for sure. So would that take the place of the myelograms? Don't let anybody do a myelogram. It's a barbaric test, unnecessary. That's old standard. Myelograms are where you put the dye. You put the dye back here, behind the bone, in the spinal canal. And you look for pressure on the nerves. We're not looking for compression. We're looking for tears. Completely different. This is a picture in the operating room. We have uh, the most advanced spine operating microscope in the world. It's called the Pentero. And it's made by Zeiss. We use it for some of our surgeries. So what is fusion? We're going to talk briefly about fusion. A long time ago, orthopedic surgeons realized when patients had painful knees that if the patient sat down and put their leg up, that the pain eased up, right? So what is the patient doing? So they're stopping the movement and they're getting the, the weight off the knee, right? So when you stop moving that arthritic painful joint, the pain eases up, the inflammation goes down. So a long time ago, an orthopedic surgeon said, hey, why don't we fuse the joint? Take the pain away. Because that fusion is a permanent immobilization procedure. So they fused the knee and the patient's knee pain went away. Miraculous. Okay. So they learned a long time ago you can fuse a joint that's painful and take the pain away. But you also take the movement away. Right? So it wasn't long before somebody figured out how do we get rid of that painful joint but keep the movement? And that's where artificial joints came in. So when you cut out a painful joint, you're getting rid of the painful joint. And you put in a metal joint. Well, metal doesn't have nerves to it. So you're replacing your painful joint that's moving, but moving with pain, with a metal joint that moves, <coughs> but moves without pain. You see? So fusion became artificial joints, and then more recently, artificial joints have become endoscopic surgery, arthroscopic surgery. So rather than 
fusing or putting an artificial knee, now they do an arthroscopic procedure, right? Less invasive, faster recovery, you don't, have, you don't need a big surgery. But outpatient is wonderful. The spine is in the same, moving in the same direction. Their spinal fusions are very common, but if now you've got artificial discs, right? So artificial joints. And then there's endoscopic surgery. So how many spine surgeons out of 6,000 in the United States do endoscopic spine surgery? Probably 10 of us out of 6,000. So you see the progression. It happened with knees and hips and shoulders, and now it's happening with spines. That's why we are at the very tip of the arrow. We're the ones creating the experience. We're the ones doing these surgeries on patients, arthroscopically, on the spine. So we're trailblazers. We're leading the pack, so to speak, here at Duke's Pine Institute. Okay? So what is a fusion? A fusion is where you basically go into the spine and you take away the movement, and by doing so, you, you fix the pain. The problem with fusion, folks, is you're going to lose your movement, number one. Number two, the recovery is going to be longer, for sure. But also, there's no standard way of doing a fusion. Every single spine surgeon does it differently. And I can tell you, many of them make mistakes that are very commonly made that cause problems for patients. One of the most common mistakes is not putting the spine in the proper alignment. Okay? God created us with a curve in our lower back. That curve is backwards. We call it lordosis. Okay? This is proper alignment. But so many times I see spines fuse straight. Why do our spines have a curve? Anybody know? No. Anybody want to venture a guess? Center mass? Makes the opening stronger. Balances the weight. Center, center mass? Center balances the weight. Yeah. Center. Good. Right. All right, watch what happens to me. Pay, pay, pay attention to my eyes. We as human beings are very visually oriented. That's our primary sensory modality of vision, right? Every day. You're not relying so much on touch. You don't rely as much on hearing or smell or taste. You rely on vision. So imagine if the alignment of my neck, which is curved perfectly right now, shifted to where it was straight. What am I looking at? Floor. I'm looking at the floor. Pleasure to meet you. How are you, sir? <laughs> right? It doesn't work, so I'd have to do something to compensate. Okay? So, all the time, patients are fused improperly with bad alignment. And it creates lots of other problems above and below the fusion. Jason said the disease. Butt pain, hip pain, everything. So getting the, the alignment just right is very important. And I can tell you this, 90% of spine surgeons don't get the alignment right. 90% of spinal fusions are done out there, and there's about 500,000 a year in the United States done. Don't get the alignment done right. And there's a reason for that. Number one, they weren't trained properly. Number two, they don't have the right equipment to do it. You need a special table. If you're going to fuse someone's back, you need a table called the Jackson Spinal Table. There's only one. It's the best. It's a $100,000 table. You actually have to pay extra. Like, every hospital comes with a $10,000 table. But if you want to do a spinal fusion properly and have the alignment right, you need a Jackson spinal table. And what that does is it puts pressure on the chest and the pelvis during surgery and lets the belly sag. So that that creates that curve. So when we fuse it, we fuse it in the proper alignment. Okay? We have two of those here. I spent $200,000 on tables just so we could get the fusions right. The hospitals won't even buy that. They won't buy something for $5,000 if you ask them. They're not going to buy a $100,000 table. They don't. They just say, just so you do ask. this here also? You do the we fusion. do fusions here, yeah. We've been doing them for a season. You can do all the different types of disc you surgery? Do any kind of surgery here on spine. Not just the lasers? No. Okay. Lasers, in my opinion, one of the best, but sometimes we do other types. We do fusions. So another reason why these other surgeons don't have good results is yeah, these question. joints called the facet joints. Just give me a second. The facet joints block movement. Okay? How many of you have seen people walking around like this? Right? That posture 
is a straightening of the spine in the lower back because the facet joints hurt too much for them to put their chest up. And they load the joints and put pressure on it and it hurts. So they ease the pressure by straightening, by, by basically getting rid of the curve in their lower spine. So I go in there and I have to remove all that arthritic joint during a fusion. And that, that allows me also to put the curve back. So 99.9% .9 of spine surgeons don't do that. So you see the problem here? Is there's a proper way to do a lumbar fusion, but 99% of the spine surgeons don't know it or don't do it because it takes extra time, it takes extra training, it's more risky, you don't get paid any extra for it. So there's a whole host of reasons they don't do it. But because of that, the results are not so good. Okay? Yes? If it's done incorrectly, can it be? Can it be uh, if it's done incorrectly, can it be reversed? No. Now, if you have a one-level fusion and they fuse you like this, I can go above it and put it in a big cage and put you back like this. So I can fix your eyes, your, your vertical horizon for your vision. You can fix this, but I can't fix what he's fused or she's fused before. That's fused. It's done. But I can correct it at the other levels. Yes? My sister has severe scoliosis, um, and she's talking about They go yeah. like this and it straightens her. Mm -hmm. She's double curved and twice. Of course, yeah. She's having a scoliosis surgery. It's, it's, like it's, I don't know specifically what you're saying they're going to do, but there's lots of different ways to do it. But most of it involves long rods and screws. Clips from the opposite side, they usually do a yeah, but it's surgically implanted. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is that kind of surgery right there. That's what it looks like. That's scoliosis surgery. Exactly what your sister would do. Yeah. You know why would you want that? So I know she doesn't want it, right? And maybe there's maybe there's an alternative. I can't tell you how many patients I've kept from having that surgery by focusing on where their pain's coming from. A lot of patients will have scoliosis from here to here. And they go see a spine surgeon. The spine surgeon says, we're going to fuse you with screws and rods from here to here and untwist you. And I said, where's your pain? Right here. What about up here? Nope. What, where's your pain again? Right here. OK. So it's consistent and it's localized to one area. I go in there and I fix the disc with the laser, and the pain goes away. I don't fix the scoliosis, but I fix the <coughs> The reason a patient comes to the doctor usually is because of some of them don't like the way they look, and that's fine. In those cases, they have to have a big surgery to face the curve. But most people with scoliosis that have pain want their pain gone. They they can compensate for the curve. Like I said, there's so many different issues in spine that are treated differently by different doctors. You got to get someone. I mean, I, I don't make all my patients happy. Okay, I'll be the first person to admit it. I can butt heads with people because I'm very opinionated. And when someone comes into my office and they say, you know, I need a fusion from here to here, I want you to do it. And I say, where's your pain? And they say, it's here. I said, you don't need a fusion from there. You just need that fix. And they disagree with me, well, then we're going to disagree. So there's lots of different opinions. Some people want the big surgery. I don't do the big surgery unless I think it's absolutely necessary. But I do believe in getting rid of pain. And if the patient says, I'm living like this every day and I can't live like this, then I think doing the big surgery is reasonable. Okay? It just depends on what the patient's goals are. After all, we're treating their pain, not mine. So I want to make my patient happy. All right. We don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to move along. These are just different kinds of fusion that we do. Screws and rods in the front, plates in the front, and the back. So you showed those tape, the, um, <coughs> the little Allen bolts that go in between the vertebrae. Which one? Let me go back one. Yeah. On that fusion cage, those little yeah. two dads there, yeah. Yeah, they're called VAK cages. Yeah. What about them? Can you do those by, by themselves, or are they all part of the same? You can, but they won't work very well. You'll still have space. Just to get the space back. Yeah. Right? I use it to get the space back get the curve back. That's correct. 
Some surgeons use it as a standalone or use a device and it doesn't work well. It uses 30% of the time. The other 70% patients still have pain because it didn't fuse. So the best fusions in the world are when you do the front and the back. That's what I do when I do a fusion. I do a combining two All right, we're going to skip ahead and get to the, to the laser surgery, okay? So the Duke laser disc repair is a surgery that I developed by taking um, endoscopic surgery techniques from other surgeons. Okay, at the time that I learned how to do this was 14 years ago, and I had to go overseas. And there were a few, about two Korean surgeons that were going in the neck and doing the herniations in the neck through the front, and there was a couple of surgeons, one in Germany, one in England, one in the United States, doing the lumbar disc herniation. So I learned from those five surgeons how to do the surgery in the front of the neck and the surgery in the lower back. And I took what they taught me and I modified it and I made it better. And by making it better, I have better results than they do. No complications and a higher success rate. So what's nice about the laser surgery is it's done through an incision that big. Okay, in the lower back, seven millimeters, and the neck, four millimeters. It's pretty incredible. And I use a laser basically <coughs> to remove that annular area, and then we call it annular debridement, and get rid of this blister, the herniation. Okay. So, we have this available on the website, right Zach? This comparison? This is a picture from one of my laser surgeries. You can actually see the patient's bodies here. There's the middle of their back, they're laying here, and we're off to the side. Okay, so my incisions are off to the side when I do laser surgery on the lower back. And that's because I'm coming at an angle, 45 degrees, through a, a natural opening that's already there. So we don't have to remove bone from the spine. All the other surgeons that do spine surgery have to take bone out. That's an advantage to you because you don't want bone taken out of your spine. It just weakens your spine. This is a bunch of stuff we've already talked about. Here's a, a picture. Of Huh? Here's a picture of, uh, yeah, you see the incision right here, and there's a the dime. Okay. So patients like it because this is, I think, a few weeks later. You can see how tiny that thing is. You get to keep the dime? Yeah, you get to keep the dime. So some people think it's not FDA approved. It's 100% FDA approved. Any surgeon that does non-FDA approved treatments in the United States is going to go to jail very quickly. So, I don't lose sleep at night. I know everything all I'm doing is legal and FDA approved. Um, the surgery has been peer reviewed. In other words, I submitted our results to my peers, other neurosurgeons. They reviewed it and they published it. They don't publish your results if they aren't good. So, they published ours twice. It was very good. No hospitalization, no complications to date. And I've been doing it now for 13 years, so this is old. It's outpatient, and we don't use any fusion. I'm not going to bore you with all this stuff. This is the one in the neck. This is a, the head right here. They're looking up. I'm going right in the neck with this tiny little metal straw. There's the endoscope. There's the camera. There's the actual endoscope, which is a series of a tube with uh, fiber optics. There's a light source right there. There's a laser, the blue thing. That's what I can see. You can see the spinal cord down there, yes, right there. You can see blood vessels on the spinal cord. And I've taken the herniation out. That's what it looks like. Yeah. No, can I do can I do this away? Oh, you for the cervical. For the cervical. No, I have to be awake. Yeah. No, the patients need to be awake. That's what the Koreans did different. They would keep the patient awake. And I don't believe in that because they've had a lot of complications. I watched them do one of their surgeries, the Koreans, and the patient was like moving around wow. in pain. Yeah. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. The spinal cord is right there. No wonder why they paralyze a few people. Just bad judgment. Just put the patient to sleep. They want the patient awake because then they're going to take the herniation out and say, how's your arm? It's better. I mean, I don't hear your patient tell me it's better. I can see if I'm taking the herniation out. And I like my patients not moving around while they're, taking, while they're doing surgery. 
So my technique is a much better technique, trust me. All right. Enough of this. Questions? I got a question. Sure. I, I'm fused, so my back basically is done. But more my question is, is at the base where the S... Um, SI joints? Yes. And, and that's fused, but I guess from the very beginning, uh, L5S1 was fused first. And I've experienced uh, at the belt line that you talked about pain. And I have those, that pain 35 years later after nine If you have pain, there's something fixable. That's my question. Does it sound like the facet, facet joints? It's hard to say. Because you're all fused. Yeah, there's, no, but there's one there. It could be the SI joints if they didn't fuse your SI joints, right? I don't think they did. Yeah, they probably did. Most of the time they don't. But there is a possibility they took bone from mm -hmm. your iliac crest. They did. And if it's iliac crest donor side pain, it doesn't go away. Well, it's all the way across, though. It isn't just that one yeah, side. I need to examine you. You want to take your pants down right now? <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I can tell where it's coming from. We can make the diagnosis. That's our first step. Okay. So if you come in and see us, I'm going to examine you, and then I'm going to have Dr. Patel numb those joints up with mm -hmm. Novocaine. Mm -hmm. And if it takes your pain away, we know it's the SI joint. Well, I am a patient of yours, or uh, Dr. Patel. All right, good. I have a question. So come see me. Yes. Before you make an appointment like here, um, do we have to go to our regular physician first to get a referral? The answer is no. You don't have to go anywhere else to get a referral unless you have an HMO plan. And an HMO plan, like a Blue Cross Blue Shield HMO plan, they won't let you go to a specialist without a primary care referral. They just don't want you spending that money. They only make. Ten billion a year profit. Come on. Yes. Um, if a minor herniated this, if I had the laser done for the herniation, could that be done on a Friday and I'd be back to work on Tuesday? Hey, what kind of work do you do? I work for Ford. I'm a trainer. But you don't have to lift heavy things, right? I no. Yeah, you could do it Friday and go back to work Saturday. Oh, really? <laughs> we have we have patients that go back to work and they text me all the time. Really? We even have one patient go to work that night. I'm not saying you should. He was a coach of a basketball team. Oh, yeah. He had a national championship. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so you can go back to work on You want to talk to Laura? She does all the schedules. Yes, sir. As far as insurance. Oh, insurance is also going to be one of our team members, but usually Lauren's in charge of that. One term that I didn't hear when we were moving about stenosis. Yes. That, that's where the district is leading. That's where things are being recommended for her. Is this the best of all? Sure. Yeah. Yes, yeah, stenosis. So he's bringing up, so there's a lot of stuff we can talk for hours. Uh, stenosis is an important one, and what it means is, is narrowing. Okay? So whether you have carotid artery stenosis, it's narrowing carotid artery, coronary artery stenosis, or spinal stenosis, it just means narrowing of the holes where the nerves come out or the spinal cord is. So it's definitely something we fix all the time. Yes? So the question is about stem cells and whether they're beneficial in any way. The answer is yes. So we didn't have a lot of experience with stem cells. Actually, nobody had. Nobody did prior to a couple of years ago. But we've been doing a fair amount of stem cell treatments on patients, and the results are surprisingly good. In other words, we didn't think it was going to work. You know, it's a new technology, a lot of new technologies don't work, but it works. It's worked quite well. So the person to talk to if you're interested in stem cells is Dr. Patel. Just get an appointment, you can talk to Lauren, and she'll get you an appointment to see Dr. Patel. I don't do stem cells, I just do it for usually, but he's the one who does stem cells. Yes, what do they use the stem cell for? Yeah, so stem cells actually have been found to 
allow your body to heal an injury that won't heal. So they're pro-inflammatory. They actually make the inflammation come in and get the job done. They help the inflammation get the job done. So it won't grow back this? No, they won't grow back in this. Well, it somehow helps. Blown out. Yeah, so if you have a joint that's arthritic and it's inflamed, putting stem cells in it frequently will stop the inflammation and get rid of the pain. Yes, sir. Does the pain come back on the fusion? No, pain will not come back on the fusion. It's it could be on a different joint. That's correct. It will be a different joint. It won't come back on the one that you fuse. No, when you fuse two bones, I mean, not, they don't. I'm sorry, not fuse this uh, laser. Oh, with the laser? No, it should not come back unless you re injure the disc. That's recovery, but... Yeah, so we looked at our patients that had laser surgery, and we, we said, okay, I want to look at charts that patients who had laser surgery five years or longer out. So they, they had their laser surgery more than five years ago. And when we collected those patients, there was about 60 of them that we could get a hold of and everything, they had 95% relief from their back and leg pain. And the average follow-up was six years. So the minimum was five, but the average was actually six. So long-term results for the laser are excellent. Great questions. Yes? What's the rationale for insurance companies? And I know you maybe need to refer me there, but what's the rationale that they don't like to pay for laser surgery? Profit. Yeah. They're profit. motivated by profit. <coughs> Even Medicare. For those of you who have Medicare, you probably don't realize, but Medicare is managed by a company called the Medicare Administrating Company. Have you heard of them? First Coast Services? How many of you have heard of First Coast Services? Yeah, First Coast Services is Blue Cross Blue Shield. Oh yeah, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. What happened was, Medicare was this big fund, right? From all your all your work and you pay your taxes, your FICA and your FUCA taxes, it's a small amount, like three percent, and it goes in and pays for Medicare for your future. So there's a huge amount of money, right? And patients would go out and get Medicare services and Medicare would pay. Well Blue Cross went to the government and said, hmm, how much did you pay last year for all those Medicare people? About two trillion. Oh, well how about if we cut it down to one point five trillion for you? Can we keep 30 cents on every dollar we save you? Sure. Yep. So they struck a deal. Guess how Blue Cross saves money for Medicare? Restricting. Denials. Restricting access to care. That's how they do for their own benefits. They don't pay for anything. Should be against the law. They should be against criminal. When I started practice, Medicare would pay for as much physical therapy as a patient needs. Right. Unlimited. Right. The doctor ordered it, they needed it, they got it. Right. So if you That's got your back fixed and your knee uh, fixed, huh? That's where it should be. Of course, doctor, it should be the patient and the sure. doctor. The patient should have the power. Right. It's your benefit. Right. The doctor should be your advisor. Right. Yes, sir. Do you guys call the insurance companies and get approvals for us, or do we have to? For what? Whatever procedure we need. Yeah, so we'll try to get approval for you, but sometimes they'll deny it. you got to make a choice. But we have an attorney now who fights insurance companies. That's all he does. And he doesn't take a penny from the patient. He takes it from me. But I don't mind paying him as long as he gets the job done. And he does a really good job. So he's on contingency. And we basically hire him on all of our cases that we can to fight the insurance company. That's what has to happen. The insurance companies understand one language and one language only. The language of lawsuits. Sorry. Have a good night, folks. Thank you. They're leaving. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. So this is a good question.